You know, it's School Choice Week, and this is a pretty provocative conversation. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeout Comfort Solutions. You know, I usually get uh, banana peels thrown at me over this whole thing because as a private school parent and a private school product, I generally don't agree with some of the things that the private school parents think they deserve. And um, it causes some conflict every once in a while, friendly conflict, I can promise you. And tonight we will be into that with a handful of guests to talk about what's happening here in Rhode Island, what they're trying to get accomplished, meaning the advocates for private schools and school choice. And so let's hustle to the rundown and take care of some things we got to take care of before we get to our guest this evening. All right, is that a deal? Uh, she's not fair. By the way, good evening. Nice to have you in. Uh, is this guy kidding me or what? Really? Really? I mean, it's just like every night now we got to come to the television and show you headlines like this. So Donald Trump is in a feud with Fox News. Uh, basically because he doesn't like Megyn Kelly. Uh, it's, it's just an ongoing thing, and Fox News is kind of fighting back and making sure that Megyn Kelly stays as moderator for the scheduled debate tomorrow night. we got a little Trump crying here, don't we, Kev? Yeah. When they sent out the Wise Guy press releases a little while ago, done by some PR person along with Roger Ailes, I said bye-bye. Trump is not used to not controlling things, but the truth is he doesn't get to control the media. It's true, and, and Fox News is, is buckling down, and I don't know what will happen with the ratings that Donald is always so concerned about. This may enhance the ratings tomorrow night for Fox. It may kill the ratings if, you know, Trump is doing some other project, raising money for the wounded warriors, he says, and CNN and MSNBC are following him around doing that. Who knows? But I mean, this whole thing has become a, a three-ring circus in so many ways, and headlines wonder out loud whether or not it's going to help or not. The, the, the last one here is about the supporters loving this, and, and I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that a lot of you folks have lost your minds, who are upset about the way you've been treated for decades by the political system, and who don't really pay attention to anything Donald says, but the way he says it, are probably thrilled that this entertainment show continues in the dramatic fashion that it is. As far as I'm concerned, Donald Trump, if he can't show up and face off against a couple of misogynistic attacks, meaning he's a misogynist, uh, which he is, from Megyn Kelly, I don't know what he's going to do with Vladimir Putin. Next item. The bills are cooking. And as we speak, don't tell anybody, but we record the show late in the afternoon. We're not live. Uh, they're probably in, they being the truck tolls. This headline kind of expresses some of the frustration that the legislators are having because not all of them really are excited about this, but are being dragged, I think, by whatever body part is available to the table to make sure that they vote for the truck tolls. Uh, there are two bills that are going to go simultaneously. One is for the actual package, which has $60 million worth of projections for 14 gantries, meaning toll locations throughout the state, Gina's stuff put in by the House Speaker and the Senate President. The other parts of it are to rearrange the funding on the uh, Garvey funds, and you don't even know what that is unless you're really paying attention. It's a mechanism, it's an, well, it's uh, an acronym for a mechanism which allows you to get a credit line on federal funding and some new federal funding coming in. The stimulus that they're projecting will be about half of what Governor Raimondo wanted to have. Accompanying that bill, will be another that will mandate that if they're going to put the tolls on cars, there'll have to be a referendum. State Representative Blake Filippi told Tara Granahan on Buddy Sancy's program about this Monday. So what we propose is a, a constitutional amendment that will limit future governments from using this network of toll gantries to assert tolls on passenger vehicles. What our constitutional amendment requires is that in order for a new passenger vehicle toll to be asserted, it would require statewide and local approval by the voter. Kind of the same way that we license casinos, if you will. So what they're doing right now, they're saying that the legislation is going to include a prohibition on passenger vehicle tolls. My concern is that a future government could repeal that prohibition, a future legislature and governor. So what we're doing is we're actually putting the power in the people's hands. 
So in the future, if there there is a, a drive to have passenger tolls, those could only happen with the authorization from the people in an election. It would be illegal to assert passenger tolls without the approval of the people. Look, I, I think the state rep means well, but he's actually making this thing worse. I understand that we're all worried, and I have been, about there being some car tolls. I mean, he was on the program with me back in November, last time I wore this shirt, actually, I think. I mean, we've got the, how did that happen? You like that? You like this shirt? <laughs> Thanks, Lex. She says it's a good color on me. Uh, but anyway, uh, what he's doing here is, he, what he's doing is letting him off the hook. See, it's a, okay, so we'll, we'll not toll cars unless we vote to toll ourselves, which we'll most likely never do. And as long as we get that out of the way, because it's all about us and our own narcissistic needs, right, we'll just, you know, absolutely screw our entire economy. It, 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 the whole thing doesn't make any sense. Having a marketing message out there that we put up 14 gantries while competitive states are trying to get rid of tolls is just insane. Insane. But it's all about taking care of labor, you know, with stimulus money. Ethics procrastination is, is the thought here. The Ethics Commission yesterday took a two-month pass on making a decision on Don Lally. Lally is the former state representative, as the headline will show you here, who um, got hired by the governor uh, into her office, passed through to the Department of Business Regulation. It's a hack job. It, it, it's a job. It's a, it's a patronage job. It's, it's a job the House Speaker wanted Don Lally to have, and Gina Raimondo acquiesced and said, sure, we'll hire him. I, if she had just been honest and said, yeah, I just hired a hack in order to make some, you know, some gain with the Speaker, I might have lived with that. But um, she phonied up and said he was a really valuable person for the work for small business in the state. I mean, it's everything that she said she wouldn't be as the governor. It's amazing the difference between campaigning and running a shop, right? Terrible. Uh, we'll see what comes up. The, the Ethics Commission is, is, is negotiating with Lally's lawyers, which means the fix is in. Uh, the friars were flat last night, you know, inconsistent and flat. Headline, difficult. This is unbelievable. Xavier, by the way, is the first time in history the two top ten teams were at the Civic Center, um, and that's pretty cool. It was a great, great atmosphere, 12,000 people sold out, uh, but the Friars were very inconsistent, as, uh, as Coach Cooley indicated. You know, I thought a lot of guys were tentative. You know, if we play the last seven minutes with the sense of urgency that we talked about, you know, and again, our, I thought they got confident, I thought they got defensive confidence when we turned the ball over in the first half. You know, so they got a little bit more confident, and I think we got a little dejected. I thought we had maybe five or six turnovers out of the first eight possessions, you know, um, and it just gave them some confidence. Hey, look, you know what? The irony about this season, terrific as it's been for Providence College so far, is that they can't win at home against the big teams, but they can beat them on the road. They're undefeated on the road against ranked teams, and Georgetown is next, and hopefully the trend continues. By the way, can I just say something to you? I mean, I'm a Friar fan when it's not URI. I'm a URI guy, you know? Uh, but why do you guys leave the dunk so early? You know, it's a minute and a half gone. A minute and a half, two minutes left, they're down eight, ten points, and you people are heading for the parking lots. It's a bad culture at the dunk that way. Fix it. Sit down. You paid for the seats. <laughs> Stay until the buzzer rings. You'll get home. All right, uh, and finally, what in the heck is going on here? Oh, the little Patriots are a little bit banged up, and so they're not going to play in the Pro Bowl, which I think is going to be extinct. Don't you think, Kevin, at some, yeah. at some juncture? A couple of guys are banged up, and a couple of guys just don't want to go to Hawaii because they're, 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 well, they just don't feel good anymore. You know what? The NFL hired you, or the NFL puts you in a place to, to make big money, as long as the game exists, you ought to play in it. Although, the other argument would be that the game is too dangerous to play all-star games. My guess is that uh, in a couple of years, there'll be no more Pro Bowl. That's two years in a row that the Patriots aren't involved. Last year, they had an excuse. They were going to the Super Bowl. All right, this is a conversation that's happening this week. It's School Choice Week, and there was a headline here recently that caught my attention, and uh, I, I, I think it's, it's at least a catalyst to an important conversation. 
So there's the Blackstone Valley Prep High School, which is up in uh, one of the Cumberland parishes, and the diocese has decided that they're not going to renew the lease. And I opined about it on the, tele on the radio uh, this week, and Kate Egan, uh, a friend and fellow parishioner at St. John Vianney, it's not going to get her anywhere in this debate, but uh, uh, you know, more or less was telling me that I had some other things to think about. Welcome to the broadcast. Nice Thank to have you. you. Um, the bishop didn't sign off on this lease because the diocese and superintendent reportedly says in the story that it's a competitive problem for Mount St. Charles and St. Raphael's. And while I understand that, I hope that they're not going to get into this big conversation about how public charter schools are infiltrating the diocesan markets. Your thought on that? Thank you, Dan, for having me. Um, so I am a member of the Parent Federation for the Catholic schools in the diocese. I wasn't privy to that decision or any part of that decision. I'm a volunteer in the schools. And I can say this, the diocese has been working with us, uh, helping us work with forming a coalition of other non-public schools for Rhode Island Families for School Choice, including we would love to have charters be a part of it. They've not joined us at this point in time. But we are definitely for all kinds of school choice. So it's not necessarily against charter. I can't speak to the decision that the bishop and the Catholic schools office made. It is more, um, I think, what the, from my perspective, what the diocese has been behind us doing is opening it up and expanding parental choice across the board, public to public district, private schools, charter schools, the whole thing. So I think, unfortunately, that story really, and I can see where it did that, took a, took a, took a spin down the other, down the other path. Hmm. All right, so we'll hold it there. Well, we'll come back and we'll expand on that a little bit. We've got uh, uh, three folks here who want to talk to you about school choice because it ain't just the Catholics. Stay no. with us. Welcome back. Kate Egan is here to talk about uh, school choice and uh, the Catholic perspective and the total Parents perspective. Parents and taxpayers. Perspective. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's what the, the bishop headline, I think, bothered the bishop from the Providence Journal. And he put this statement out, or the diocese did today. Um, Despite recent reports in the media, the Diocese of Providence is not opposed to charter schools in principle. The diocese has, in fact, several other agreements with charter schools already in place, and he cites them. The decision not to renew a lease in Cumberland was not made lightly. Uh, it was done after a lengthy consultation process. They'll consider future arrangements on a case-by-case -case basis. So he, 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 he doesn't want that cancellation of a lease in Cumberland with the Blackstone Valley Prep to be indicative of an overall disposition. I'm happy about that. I think his yes. superintendent was over his skis suggesting that there are problems here with the public charter schools that in fact because the kids wear uniforms and there's high academic standards and the curriculum kind of matches up that other than the faith issue there's really no difference between the two. My argument on the radio and I'm sure you would agree with this is that the faith issue is really important in Catholic schools. Wasn't it? It was for you. The, it it faith is for your issue kids. Is a, is a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, they got to market that. Yes, that's got to be marketed. Well, and I and you got my Irish up the other day <laughs> on the radio to say Good. one thing you said. I, I remember hearing was about marketing it and not having. We uh, last year I went and checked with the numbers. Last year, the diocese could only meet 8% of the determined need for those that were coming to Catholic schools that had financial need. So there is a market out there. There, is, there are people that are interested in a Catholic education that cannot afford one. So I don't know how much of it is a, is a marketing thing, so well, to say. Well, I understand and, that. And we have increased, they have increased 50% their portfolio the last 10 years. That was another thing you had said. That well, 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 here's the thing. The di maybe it was edited out, but the diocese and superintendent didn't make that point. What he was saying is, hey, listen, we're one for one. We might be losing people because, you know, they evaluate the cost and they see that the charter schools are free, free under the taxpayer budget. Uh, so what the heck? And I'm saying, well, wait a second. The reason I spent, you know, five digits annually for tuition uh, at Mount St. Charles for my own daughter was because of the other moral and faith issues that I was hoping and I think did uh, benefit her in her Catholic experience. And I think that's something that unfortunately uh, can't, I, I think it was diminished by the diocese. You're not here to make the diocese no. an argument. You're here to suggest <laughs> that 
you know what? Well, don't let me put words in your mouth. You think your taxpayer dollars should be extracted for the prorated value of what private education is. You want school choice and you want vouchers to support it, correct? I don't necessarily want vouchers. I, I am interested in education savings accounts, which is a whole different whole different level of it. Um, we already have a form of school choice here in Rhode Island in a tax credit program that businesses can apply and they get up to $1.5 million um, dollars of tax credit. And I'll let our other guests talk to that. They're a little more and they know about that. So, but what I'm looking for is expanded parental choice. I'm looking for um, people to be able to say, this is my child, this is the best environment, be it faith-based, be it the education that's offered there, be it whatever that may be, that they can make that choice. I, I know of a, of a young man who's in high school right now who started out in a public school that was not the right environment for him. Then he had the opportunity to go to a charter school. And I say opportunity, because right now that is, it's hard to get in. They're, they're a lottery system, which also that how much of a choice is that? That environment didn't work out. He ended up going to a small private Catholic school and he, that, that wouldn't work. So even with the charters, which I think are wonderful and I think we need, I, and the other thing you said the other day was about that we wanted the status quo. We, we're not supporting the status quo to get money. No, no I'm not talking about you being a right, status right. quo protector. Right. What I was concerned about is that the Catholic argument would support the status quo protectors who are uh, who are the public school institutional you know union leaders and government elected officials who want to see charter schools get stymied we don't we want charters we want uh, as parents and the parent federation and and the diocese has supported us in this and they've helped us form this coalition Rhode Island families for school choice uh, which we're going to have a reception tomorrow with the uh, legislature for um, we want the public school choice, we want the charter school choice, we want the home school choice, we want the Catholic school choice, we want the Christian school choice, we want whatever that choice is. It's our tax dollars going in that create the revenue of the education system, and we need the yeah. system to work for the choices. Okay. I, mean, I have two kids, they're, they're in two, they're two different places of, of people. I mean, they're the, uh, my younger one's probably also going to be... Look, it's all about the money. You want the money to go around. You can choose to go wherever you want. You want taxpayer money to pay for your choice because to send your kid the to parochial school. I don't want them to say, I don't want them to even do the whole bit of it. But in the town of Cumberland, where I live, 75% yeah. um, of your tax dollars goes into the schools. I am 100% for, before we had children, 100% for the schools. Uh, after we have children, 100% for the schools. Right now, because that choice didn't work for us, we needed another choice, or we felt we needed another choice, which I won't get into with our own children. But um, I'm paying that, and I'm paying the other, and there's it's squeezing. It is. It is. It's tough. It it's a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice that, like I said, we're not meeting 92 percent of the need of it. It's a. It's, right. it's one well, that listen, we th can this, make. I, I knew that the time that we had available for this show would find you frustrated. So after the <laughs> after the week, come back. We'll have more of this debate, even in the next week or two, because I, I want to keep the conversation hot. When we come back, we've got uh, some folks who are not Catholic, uh, but may have the same perspective. Stay with us. Alrighty, so it's not just about the Catholics and school choice, you know, when it comes to private schools. We do have a, a Barrington Christian Academy that uh, Rachel is uh, representing and uh, the, the Hebrews uh, Day School and um, the rabbi is representing and you're representing the comps concept of school choice. Welcome to both of you, by Thank the way. You. Thanks Thank for you. joining me. You're, you're number, off Kate Egan's conversation and the school choice thing. I'm glad that we have other than Catholic representation in this. What is your big point on school choice? I think the, the concept is, is that parents should have the ability to make their choice vis-a-vis -vis even inter-district changes, et cetera, within the public school, mm. as Kate said, expanded school choice across charter schools, across all private schools. I think tuition affordability across the board has become a challenge, and I think that investing in uh, private school education, as well as in the public school education, which is already being invested in, to some extent is only gonna up the standard of education in the state of Rhode Island. What's a tuition fee for, for your school? Our tuition, our tuition fees range uh, between about twelve and $16,000. Okay, so kind of in the Catholic school environment, sort of. Is it grammar and high school we level? Do, we have a girls' high school as well. Same thing for you? We're K through 12. Okay. And the price range is about the same. All right. Nine to twelve. You have a three-pointer for me. I do. So I would really like to see the state of Rhode Island increase the corporate tax credit. Right now, it's at one point five million, and it really needs to be at five. 
Last year, um, 76 corporations wanted to give money to private schools so that children who are from disadvantaged homes are able to attend these schools. And out of the 76 corporations that applied for this tax credit, only 23 were able, were used up that $1.5 million. So that's a problem. And that demand increases every year. So I would like to see that cap raised to $5 million. Okay. Two. Um, number two, I would like to see um, the state come up with great educational programs that are available and accessible to all Rhode Island students. So for example, we've got Prepare RI, which is um, early, early college entrance. And right now it's only available to public school students. If you're a homeschooled kid or if you're a private schooled kid, no go. You don't get to access early college um, okay. on, the, on the state's bill. And the third thing I think is most important is to provide parents the choice um, on where to, where to spend their tax dollars. So we all put tax money in, and I think it's important that, yeah. that we, have, we have a choice on where to spend our tax education. Well, it's just, it's just, it comes back to the same thing. I, even though those other issues, I think, are, are vital and important, and I bet you there's a lot of consensus that you can draw on those, uh, you also represent uh, a, a point of view, which is that the tax pool ought to be carved out by people who want to opt out of it in, in a private investment. It, you know what, it's one of those things where I like chocolate, you like vanilla. I mean, it, it's almost where the debate seems to just kind of stop. Um, I don't know how you, I, 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 just don't, I just don't know how private school parents don't recognize that there's a potential serious erosion of the public school resourcing to well, be able to educate all kids. I think, I think a lot of private school parents understand that very well because a lot of private school parents started in public school. I mean, my children, I have four children, I started in public school. I went, went to charter school with all four of my kids and I knew that what they needed was a faith-based education. So I have been putting tax dollars in and I have been volunteering at all those schools and I think it's important, especially at Barrington Christian Academy when we have students that apply um, that are looking for a smaller class size or they're looking for more of a faith-based um, education um, and, and a quality academic um, setting that I think it's, it's valid that, that their tax dollars be able to be used where they're at. Last word, Rabbi. I think that, again, parents should not be forced based on zip code to send their child to a specific school because some of those schools may be failing schools. We have great universities in town, great education in town, Brown University, and many others, to name just a few. Uh, I'm not so sure that those accountabil accountability standards hold, uh, hold true uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. And I think accountability is something that's good, and it will only help everybody. And I think... Uh, one of the things that our private schools and faith-based schools are doing is preparing our students to compete in a globally competitive society. In, in, indisputable, indisputable, but always comes down to money. Um, you'll feel shortchanged here with the time that we don't have left, but come on the radio and, and spend some time with us in the sure. next week or two, and we'll talk more about it, okay? Um, thank you, um, and good luck tomorrow at the legislature. Thank you. Final word when we come back. Stay with us. Uh, we'll continue the conversation on school choice on the radio with these guests in the, in the next couple of days. I'll let you know when that's going to happen. Uh, the Good Samaritan bill passed this week at the legislature. We'll talk about that here tomorrow night on My State of Mind. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening.